Chapter 12, Brother I'm Dying by Edwige Dantica The Angel of Death and Father of God In 1990, General Prosper Avril resigned, making room for the December 1990 elections, in which a young priest named Jean-Bertrand Aristide, who had developed a massive following through his bold sermons against the Duvaliers, won 67% of the vote. Aristide was sworn in on February 7, 1991, my uncle's 68th birthday. I remember talking to my uncle that night. After accepting my birthday wishes, he moved on to Aristide, saying that the young priest he saw, uh, in the young priest he saw flickers of his one-time hero, Daniel Fignol. Aristide's firebrand speeches and his polit political party, the Lavalas or Flood Party echoed what Fignol used to call his Wulo Comprese, or Steamroller, his throng of rabidly loyal supporters to which my uncle had belonged. Like most people, my uncle had voted for Aristide. He's certainly the best man, he said, but in my old age, I'm no longer interested in best men. I'm interested in the people around me and what he can, he can do for them. But only seven months later, on September 30th, 1991, Aristide was ousted by a military coup. Aristide fled to Venezuela, then Washington, where he stayed for three years. Still, like most of the population, which had eagerly elected him, Bel Air residents remained steadfast in calling for his return through protests and demonstrations. In retaliation, the army raided and torched houses and killed hundreds of my uncle's neighbors. My uncle managed to stay out of harm's way by avoiding the demonstrations and all the other overtly political activity, including speaking out against the military from the pulpit of his church. Still, every morning he got up to count the many bloody corpses that dotted the street corners and alleys of Bel Air. During the years when he couldn't speak, he had developed a habit of jotting things down, so he kept track of the cadavers and the small notepads he always carried in his jacket pocket. In his notebooks, he wrote the names of the victims, when he knew them, the condition of their bodies, and the times they were picked up, either by family members or by sanitation service, to be transported to the morgue or dumped in mass graves. Jonas, uh, point twenty ounce, main draw, absente, 1135 a.m. Gladys, point thirty-five ounce, nue, 309 p.m. Samuel, 75 ounce, Shani, 5.42 p.m. Male, 0.25 ans, visage mutile, 9.17 p.m. Jonas, maybe 20 years old, missing right hand, 11.35 a.m. Gladys, maybe 35 years old, naked, 3.09 p.m. Samuel, 75 years old, shoeshine man, 5.42 p.m. Unknown male, 25 years old, face mutilated, 9.17 p.m. Over the first weeks of the coup, my father called nearly every day, begging my uncle and Tante Denise to leave Bel Air. They'd go to Legoland, Legoland for a few days to visit with Tante Denise's sister, Leon, but would always return in time for Sunday services. Anxious, my father became angry, shouting at the end of their conversations, You're responsible. Whatever happens to you there, you're responsible if you don't leave. I'm not sure why my uncle and Tante Denise never left for good. Maybe it's as simple as not wanting to be driven out of their home. After Marie Micheline died, I asked my uncle why they, and in turn Marie Micheline, uh, hadn't tried to move to New York like my parents did. It's not easy to start over in a new place, he said. Exile is not for everyone. Someone has to stay behind to receive the letters and greet family members when they come back. Plus, he had more work to do, more souls to save, more children to teach. In the fall of 1994, Aristide returned to Haiti, accompanied by 20,000 U.S. soldiers. Citing the brutality of the military regime and the menace of a mass exodus of Haitian re refugees to nearby Florida, then-President Bill Clinton launched Operation Uphold Democracy. The day Aristide returned, Tante Denise suffered a mild stroke. After more than two decades away, my cousin Maxo returned to Bel Air. That fall, I too went back to Haiti for the first time, at 25 years old. On the ride to Bel Air, I looked through the cracked window windshield of a hired car and saw more 
people on the now rutted streets than I ever remembered. On nearly every wall was a mural of a rooster, the symbol of Aristide's La Valas party, or of the or of the American military helicopter on which Aristide had flown back to the National Palace. There were also monuments to losses everywhere, the charred shanty towns of La Saline and Cite Soleil, uh, the busts and friezes of the murdered, a justice minister, a campaign financier, and a beloved priest among thousands of others. Piles of brick and ashes stood where homes and offices had been, places that had been both constructed and destroyed in the time I'd been gone. Chunks of Port-au-Prince, I realized, had been wholly assembled and disassembled in my absence. In many other ways, however, very little had changed. The crippled beggars were still lined up on the steps of the National Cathedral and used booksellers' scattered stands across from it. The waterwomen still carried by the bucket on their heads. The colorfully painted lottery stands were still selling hundreds of tickets to hopeful dreamers. The visa applicants were still gathered in droves at the gates of the American consulate. My uncle's street was now crammed with oddly shaped unfinished concrete homes. The alleys were gutted and filled with trash, yet when he showed me the list of casualties written in handwriting so tiny he had to help me decipher them, all I could see was Jonas, Gladys, Samuel, and hundreds of men and women who died, their mutilated bodies eternally rotting under the boiling sun. Uncle Joseph and Tant Denise's apartment was painted pink like the old house except the dining room overlooking the tiny courtyard which was bright turquoise. Tant Denise was considerably thinner, her movements measured and slow. Her hair, which had begun and then stopped dying, which she had begun, di begun and then stopped dying, was bright red at the tips and gray at the roots. She touched it self-consciously when she saw me. I don't have my wig. She winced and pushed her head forward even as I moved closer. She was sitting on a cot in the living room where she took her naps and sometimes also spent the night. Her swollen legs were propped on a low stool and an open-toed sandal dangled from them. A pedestal fan was spinning in a semicircle in a corner by the window and occasionally blew a stream of warm air into her face. She was wearing a plain white cotton nightgown, which I was told she wore most of the time. She smelled of castor oil and camphor, uh, just as her grandma Melina had. Her glamour, her elegant dresses, her pretty face, her wigs, her gloves now seemed very far in the past. She, like these buildings, had been disassembled while I was gone. She didn't recognize me at first. It's Edwige, I said, feeling like a stranger now, to, uh, not just to her, but to Bel Air and to Haiti itself. Mira's daughter, Edwige, she said. Her lower lip was drooping, slightly slurring her speech. Grabbing my, ha my hand with more strength than I expected, she pulled me down on her lap as if I were still a child. Edwige, let me tell you a story, she said, pressing her elbows hard into my ribs. The story she told slowly, haltingly, with her arms braced tightly around my body, was about God and the angel of death. It was one of Grammy Molina's stories, one that Grammy Molina said you told uh, to keep death away. In the end, Grammy Melina stopped telling that story because she wanted to die. One day, began Tante Denise, a line of drool trickled from one side of her mouth, which I kept dabbing with the towel that draped the back of the chair. Father God and the Angel of Death were strolling together in a neighborhood like Bel Air, in a very crowded city like Port-au-Prince, she continued. During their walk, the Angel of Death would stop in front of many houses and say, a man died here last month. I took him. Then as they continued down the street, the angel of death added, I removed a grandmother from this house yesterday. I make people, and you take them, said Father God. That's why they like me more than they like you. You think so? asked the angel of death. I certainly do, said Father God. If you're so sure, said the angel of death, why don't we both stop here on Rue Termasse? and asked the same woman for a drink of water and see what happens. So Father God rapped on the nearest door, and when the lady of the house opened it, said, Madame, can I trouble you for some water? No, the woman answered, irate. I don't have any water to spare. Please, said Father God, I'm parched. Sorry, said the woman, 
but I can't spare any water. The public tap has been dry. The public tap has been dry for days, and I have to buy water by the bucket from the water woman, who's doubled the price. So I only have enough water for myself and my family. I'm sure you'd give me some water if you knew who I was, said Father God. I don't care who you are, said the woman. The only one I'd give my water to now is the angel of death. But I'm God, insisted Father God. Why would you give your water to the angel of death and not to me? Because, the woman said, the angel of death doesn't play favorites. He takes us all, lame and stout, young and old, rich and poor, ugly and beautiful. You, however, give some people peace and put some of us in war zones like Bel Air. You give some enough food to stuff themselves while others starve. You make some powerful and others defenseless. You make some healthy and let some get sick. You give some all the water they need, while some of us have very little. Bowing his head in shame, Father God walked away from the woman, who, when the angel of death came to her door, gave him all the water she had in the house. And because of this, Tante Denise concluded, unaware, it seemed, of even my body as heavy and limp now as hers, on her lap, the angel of death did not visit this particular woman again for a very long time.